Hello and welcome to this clip which looks at uh, trends across periods in the periodic table. In other words, what happens when shielding stays the same between one element and another. Um, now in another clip we've looked at what happens when you go on a group. We've looked at group 2, we've got one on uh, group 7 as well. Uh, but it's also quite important to be able to think about what happens as you go across a row from one group to another but with the same level of shielding. So by way of reviewing a range of earlier A-level topics in the first year, what we'll try and do in this clip is to cover some of the trends in a number of properties across periods 2 and 3. So the properties we'll look at are first ionisation energy, melting and boiling points, and any changes in lattice structure as you go across a period. And we'll also have a special bit on, um, on graphene, which is an allotrope of carbon in addition to graphite, diamond, and Buckminster fullerene. This is a common um, application of uh, structure and, and bonding in giant structures that's now coming onto many A-level syllabuses, so it's worth having a look at it. And finally, at the end of the clip, I'll, I'll look at a special section on how to approach and go for longer answer unstructured question types. And they're commonly applied by exam boards to this particular topic, so it's worth flagging that up at the, at the beginning of the clip in case you wanted to fast forward to it now. So the first part of the clip will cover the various properties and the bit on graphene and carbon, and the later part of the clip will go through some examples of unstructured questions and how you might want to look at planning your answers. So it's an important a bit of exam skill advice. So let's start by uh, reviewing first ionisation energy. It's defined at the top of the page according to our specification. So going down a group, shielding is by far the major factor affecting first ionisation energy values. However, as you go across a period, the shielding doesn't really change, not significantly at least. So the overriding factor now must be the proton number, sometimes called nuclear charge. So therefore, because you have similar shielding across a period, the first ionisation energy must increase because the overriding factor is the increase in nuclear charge, which therefore leads to an increase in nuclear attraction in this particular case. So it's also worth pointing out that another consequence of this extra nuclear attraction is that the electron shells are drawn in closer to the nucleus, as you can see from the diagram and therefore the atomic and ionic radii actually decrease as you go across the period. They don't increase, they get smaller. So this isn't quite so straightforward, and you always need to link this to the lattice type and the bonds or intermolecular forces that may need to be overcome. And a very common mistake that we see in exams is uh, the assumption that covalent bonds are automatically broken when a covalent lattice melts or boils. We'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in a second, um, because obviously in some cases um, covalent bonds are broken, but in other cases they're not. It's very important to be able to uh, distinguish between the two. So what we'll do in this screen is attempt to try and um, help you to distinguish between the covalent lattices where this does take place and those where it doesn't. So the graph we've got here actually represents two periods in the periodic table period 2 and period 3. So I've split it down the middle there for you to make it a little bit easier to manage. And now we'll have a look at what is causing these trends. So if we look at period 2 first of all, we start off with giant metallic lattices, moving over to giant covalent lattices, and then finally simple molecular lattices. And we have a similar kind of trend in period 3 as well. So obviously, if you take the similar points in each period, let's say the fourth element along, the giant covalent, and compare carbon and silicon, it's what we looked at earlier, isn't it? It's the increase in uh, atomic radius. And in the silicon case, uh, you have a larger atomic radius, so therefore a weaker nuclear attraction for the outer shell electrons. So the giant covalent um, structure is not as strong, so therefore it has a lower boiling point. So what we're interested in is what's going on across the period. Why are these particular types of structures happening? 
So looking at the explanations behind the changes in lattice type, it's worth pointing out from a teacher's perspective that when you get a student that answers and explains the structure and bonding in type question and then reels out stuff from GCSE about dot cross diagrams and gives uh, really nice dot cross diagrams for covalent or for ionic structures, they're missing the point of the question a bit. You must try to take those ideas forward into A level. So hopefully some of what I'll cover on this screen will help you do just that. One way of th looking at it is to link it to ionization energy, because they are in a way linked. So metals on the left hand side will lose electrons very easily, or lose an electron in the case of period um, 2. The definition of ionization actually specifies that one mole of electrons is lost from one mole of um, gaseous atoms to make one mole of gaseous one plus ions. So the giant metallic lattice model, <laughs> not lettuce, the giant metallic lattice model works on the left hand side. So the, the um, properties that go with that, such as high melting point, good electrical conductivity, etc., uh, would be what you'd expect. As you move towards the middle, um, specifically carbon, for example, you have elements which tend to form several covalent bonds per atom due to having three or four electrons in their outer shell, hence multiple strong covalent bonds per atom. At the same time, the atomic radius is decreasing and the nuclear attraction is increasing. So for the purpose of A-level, we really just focus on carbon as having this model. Boron is a little bit different. It's got different types of um, properties, some of which are slightly metallic, some of which are slightly um, non-metallic. So we're focusing specifically on carbon here. So if we go over to um, the right-hand side for uh, nitrogen, oxygen and fluorine, so what happens here is that the elements have almost full outer shells, so five electrons in the outer shell for nitrogen, six electrons in the outer shell for oxygen, and seven electrons in the outer shell for fluorine. Their ability to form multiple covalent bonds, unlike carbon, starts to diminish. And instead, they've got to rely on weak London forces, intermolecular forces instead, to hold their lattices together. And it's really important to remember that covalent bonds are not broken when these elements at this end of the periodic table, such as nitrogen, oxygen, or, fu or fluorine, um, melt or boil. It is intermolecular forces that are breaking. The London forces are being overcome. The London forces are weaker than the uh, giant covalent bonds or the giant metallic lattice, um, the attractions between the electrons in the delocalized cloud and the metal ions. So the London forces are weaker than either of those two um, uh, bonds or forces, so therefore um, the boiling points and melting points of the nitrogen, oxygen and fluorine are much, much lower. It's really, really important to get that difference. It's possibly the number one mistake people make when answering long answer questions about this area in exams. So what we're going to focus on here is smaller variations as you go across the period. So I'll bring up the diagram I had earlier uh, where we had the overall trends. So if we focus at the beginnings of each of the periods, let me put a demarcation line in the diagram just to remind ourselves where those, um, that those two periods are separated. You can see quite clearly that what happens as you go across a period is that the number of electrons that are delocalized into the electron cloud on the metal side starts to increase. And what this leads to is greater attraction between the delocalized electrons and the metal ions. This is because of greater charge difference. So, for example, in sodium, the charge difference is 2, plus 1 for the metal ions, and minus one for the electrons. In magnesium, the charge difference is three, plus two for the metal ions, and minus one for the electrons. In aluminium, you can see where this is going. It's a charge difference of four, plus three on the metal ions, and minus one on the electrons. So let's look at the trend between phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon. 
It's a trend that isn't really um, repeated to quite the same extent in their equivalent sister elements in period two, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. You can just about make out some similarities, but the values for nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon are so low that it's almost negligible on the scales we're talking about on the y-axis. So what's happening here to hold these lattices together is uh, instantaneous dipole-dipole interactions, or London forces, as can be illustrated in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. So if we take phosphorus, phosphorus only has four um, atoms in its molecule. So if you only have four atoms in your molecule, you have less London forces, and therefore less energy required to overcome them, so you have a slightly lower boiling point or melting point. So with sulphur, you have eight atoms per molecule, twice as many London forces or twice as many opportunities for London forces, more energy to, uh, required to overcome them. It's also worth pointing out at this stage that the extra London forces in sulphur are due to more points of surface contact. There's more points of surface contact on an S8 molecule than there are on a P4 molecule. So sulphur has a higher boiling point. So with chlorine, there's only two atoms per molecule. A few points of surface contact as a result, so therefore less or weaker London forces, meaning less energy required to overcome them. It's worth pointing out that the solid chlorine lattice that's given in the diagram is there for illustrative purposes only, so you can see how far apart the chlorine molecules are from each other, even in solid form. This would obviously occur at very low temperatures um, because of the very, very weak London forces between adjacent molecules. And of course, just a cheeky little reminder um, that no covalent bonds are broken during the melting or boiling of simple molecular lattices, such as those found in phosphorus, sulphur, chlorine, argon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or neon. So I'll say it again, no covalent bonds are broken, only London forces. So let's take a quick look at carbon. It forms a number of allotropes, meaning that each of these versions has a different arrangement of the same atoms, so carbon in this case, and exists in the same physical state as the others at room temperature. So three of these allotropes are shown with a slightly different arrangement of carbon atoms. You've got graphite, which has um, layers, um, three carbons, sorry, three uh, carbon has three covalent bonds to um, other carbon atoms, and the fourth electron in the alpha shell is delocalized. So in the case of diamond, each carbon atom has four normal covalent bonds. So, no electrical conductivity for diamond, but it has many strong covalent bonds to break, so very high melting point and physical strength. So just going back to graphite for a second, the layers can slide over each other, so graphite's softer than diamond and has lower melting point. In the case of Buckminster fullerene, you've got 60 carbon atoms in a geodesic dome structure. It's named after the architect, the American architect Buckminster Fuller, and discovered at Sussex University by um, Professor Sir Harry Croteau. Uh, strong and high melting point and many new applications in nanotechnology as well as other fields. I'm also going to focus on the, uh, the more recent uh, discovered allotrope of carbon, which is called graphene, which is derived from graphite but has um, quite specific properties that are separate from graphite. So graphene is essentially an individual layer of graphite, one atom thick. It's also very strong and can conduct electricity. So it's worth being aware of these four major allotropes of carbon and their various properties. And also the fact that every single one of these will be considered to have giant covalent lattices. So if you're asked in a question, for example, what the, um, the lattice type would be and to predict the likely properties, 
you go with giant covalent, so therefore many strong covalent bonds have to be overcome, high energy requirement to do so. And in the case of graphite and graphene, you've additionally got um, electrical conductivity. So now we're on to our exam questions section, and this is a typical example, this one. You can see by the little pencil next to it, in your answer you should use appropriate technical terms spelt correctly. So it asks you to describe the structure and bonding shown by these elements. So this essentially means discuss the lattice type and what is needed to cause it to melt. And it says use your answer to explain the difference in melting points. Which means essentially connect your ideas about the lattices you've just talked about to why these two elements have such different melting points. So just looking at the bottom of the paper, it's a six mark question, so we have to plan it out quite carefully. So because I'm talking about two different elements, the first thing I'm going to do is to separate my answer into a magnesium section and a chlorine section. So that now means I can say three things about each. First thing I do is I talk about the structure. So if you look at what I've done, I haven't just gone into one with magnesium or gone into one with chlorine. I've stuck to my lattice type and I've stated quite clearly what lattice type I've got in each case. Now I can start to say something about the type of bonding. So I've talked about metallic bonding which is electrostatic attraction between positive metal ions and delocalized electrons. I ran out of room clearly on the right hand side. You may prefer to actually write out electrons instead of E minus. I would say that's probably a better idea. So kind of my bad there, I'm afraid. But it might be worth having a think about that. So simple molecular lattice. What does that mean? So we're talking about London forces between chlorine molecules, or I should say Cl2 molecules. Now finally, you need to say how this leads to the difference in melting point. So now we need to move the page down a bit and use the space we've got further down. So my final points, my fourth and fifth mark, states that London forces are weaker than metallic bonds, so therefore London forces require less energy to overcome in chlorine than metallic bonds in Mg, in magnesium. So what did I do in the end? So what you've got to do is to look at the context of the question. It's all about melting point. So this last bit should compare the points you've made earlier on when you're describing the two different lattices, but bring them together to describe the difference or explain the difference in melting point. So that part over the top where it says, use your answer to explain the difference in melting points, that's the bit I'm doing here. So a little bit of forward planning when you do these types of questions is massively helpful. So the idea should be that when you come across this type of question, sort of five, six, or seven marks, for example, and you're given lots of space in which to write, you state the um, obvious things about the, uh, the lattices, making sure that you've boot camped, obviously, the ideas, and you're getting them right, so you're not making mistakes, such as saying that covalent bonds break in chlorine, for example. So you lay out your, your ideas in simple bullet points. Don't worry about writing tons and tons of text. If it helps to actually do subheadings like I've done here, magnesium and chlorine, then do so. But you must at the end try and bring your ideas together and make comparative statements. London forces weaker than metallic bonds. So London forces require less energy to overcome. So let's try another one now. This one's talking about atomic radii. It's not quite as uh, detailed as the previous one. It's only four marks, but we can have a go at it. Why don't you pause the clip and try this one, and then resume the clip when you're ready to have it checked. So if you pause the clip now, grab a scrap of paper and, some, and a pen. Um, you can use your textbook or notes, it's not under exam conditions or anything, but see if you can plan out an answer in the way that I suggested in the previous example. So I decided to split this into four bits, because there's four marks. So starting with atomic radii, we know that they decrease. So now we need to explain what might be causing this. The nuclear charge goes up because there's more protons. But the shielding stays the same. So it stays the same because there's the same number of shells. So therefore, 
So we're closing the circle. So by going through the factors of nuclear charge and shielding, they allow us to conclude what the cause of the decrease of the atomic radius in the first place is, which is nuclear attraction. So what do we say about nuclear attraction? Obviously it increases across the period. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this clip. Hopefully it was a reasonably useful review of some of the factors that go into the trends across the periodic table, certainly across the period. And uh, it may be some use uh, to have a look at how to do uh, longer answer questions as well. So for now, thank you for your time. Thanks for listening, and see you soon.